extensive post-mortem mutilation of the body. Taylor Shabiznis, and yep, that's her real name. And I do have to just get this out really fast before we get into the serious stuff. She would have been better served minding her own shabiznis on the night of February 22nd, 2022. Taylor Shabiznis, a 25 year old woman residing in Green Bay, Wisconsin. I don't know why, but we seem to see a lot of Wisconsin on this channel is in court this week, facing trial on the following charges. First degree intentional homicide, mutilating a corpse and third degree sexual assault. After being arrested for the crime, the details of which we'll explore in a minute, she even <laughs> made several statements to police admitting her involvement, which a judge ruled this past June will be admissible at trial. If you're following so far, you may have put together that she is going with a not guilty by reason of mental disease or defect defense. If I were on that jury, I wouldn't buy it. When you hear what Shabiznis is alleged to have done and said, you just may agree. The inciting incident, like what happened that led law enforcement officers to be involved in these proceedings, was a 911 call placed from a residence in Brown County, Wisconsin, about a, oh my God, about a severed head that was found in a bucket in the basement of said residence. <sighs> yeah. It is that bad that fast. The person whom the head in the bucket belonged to was 24 year old Shad Therion. And the person who placed the 911 call was his mother's boyfriend, which he got on the phone with 911 after she woke him up sobbing, obviously, after discovering what Taylor had been up to in the basement. Yeah. Where's that? Right there. Look right, there's a bucket where it's hard. Chad's mom knew that he'd been hanging out with a friend the day or two prior in that same basement, and this friend was Taylor Shabiznis. Shad and Shabiznis reportedly met in middle school, dated for a little while, and then recently had had a friendly relationship that had become sexual. And on the day this crime occurred, the two of them had been engaging in Breaking Bad style hug use. We're not deep enough into this YouTube video for me to say the actual terms here, but I hope you can put two and two together. As there was a benefits part to their friend relationship, they also engaged in that aspect on this specific day. And then somehow, somehow, a dog collar becomes involved in the proceedings. If you've raised a dog, you may be familiar with the pee collar, which is sometimes used for training. And it's, it's called the pee collar because of the shape it makes when it's used properly. The way that that collar works is that the harder that it's resisted against, the tighter it becomes around the animal's neck. And this pee collar would come to be wrapped around Shad's neck and Taylor. What does Taylor do once Shad has the dog collar on during their encounter? She grips it, grabs it as tightly as she can, and then begins strangling him. And we know these details because Taylor oh so helpfully sat for an interrogation the day after the discovery of Shad's remains where she held absolutely nothing back. Taylor stated that at one point while she was choking him, she could feel Shad's heart beating and so she kept kept on pulling and choking him harder, but he reportedly just would not die. She kept going as his face turned purple and he coughed up blood because she, quote, wanted to see what would happen. After Shad is finally deceased, Taylor described how long his homicide took as somewhere between like three to five minutes. I don't know if I trust her timekeeping skills though, given what we know about what they were up to. She then disclosed to police that after Shad was deceased, she um, violated his remains intimately for what she reported as hours. You can go read the probable cause affidavit linked below if you need to know the specifics of her necrophilia. I'm not gonna say it here. Oh, so I understand if you need to take a breather, 100% get it. For those of you who don't, or for those of you who may have just come back from one, 
You might be wondering, well, if Shad's head was in the bucket, where was the rest of him? Turns out, Taylor hadn't only beheaded her victim, she had completely dismembered him. When officers ran into Taylor that same day, the 23rd, and I wanna say right here, all credit to Shad's mother for being aware of who her son was associating with, I don't wanna even think about for a second what Taylor business had got, would have been able to get up to if she was left unattended for like a single hour past when the police got her. And they caught her coming out of her apartment building with dried blood clearly visible on her sweatshirt and pants. Hi. Hi, Taylor, how's it going? Officer Russell with the Green Bay Police Department. Just make sure you ain't got nothing on you here. Taylor, you have a warrant for your arrest. Just put your hands together back with Anybody else in your apartment? You got When they entered into the vehicle she had been using for the day, and which it seemed like she had been in the process of going back out to when they ran into her outside of her apartment complex, they discovered a crockpot box containing additional human body parts, including legs. Hmm? And that's, I'm, that's me quoting directly from the probable cause affidavit. Taylor, like this woman was just a complete messed up psycho driving around in a van with some human legs and other unlisted, unspecified body parts in her van. Shad's member, shall we say, was also found in the bucket that his head was in. The rest of Shad was spread out amongst tote and shopping bags that Taylor had left in the basement. Specifically mentioned is an upper torso, and I don't even want to think about how that's delineated or ugh, more specifically how Taylor delineated poor Shad. According to Taylor, her plan was to remove Shad's entire set of remains from the family home, and once police came in contact with her, she reportedly made several comments around the fact that she couldn't believe that she forgot the head. That's so crazy. Yikes. Now, it's not like she showed up to the Therion residence with a bag of knives. No, her instruments were from the very kitchen of the home that she'd been invited into. I think the only things that she brought into that home were drug paraphernalia and a complete lack of humanity wiped away by methamphetamine use. This trial is going on right now, like opening statements were Monday, July 24th, and from what I can tell, Taylor's defense is going with the I have to get up here and say something angle. He mentions that Taylor like wasn't at the scene of the crime when police arrived after receiving the 911 call like that has any bearing on her innocence. Like, like in this country, you can't convict somebody if you don't literally catch them at the murder scene. I don't, I don't know where the logic is there. His opening statement, her defense lawyer's opening statement feels meandering and unfocused. I don't, and I mean, I don't have great things to say about the prosecutor's opening either, but the defense seemed pointless. Speaking of the prosecutor's opening, and side note, I wish this guy had taken inspiration from Chandler Halderson's prosecutor. It seemed like they're going with the, <laughs> she did this, we have bulletproof watertight evidence she did this, and being high on meth that you voluntarily ingested doesn't reduce culpability angle, which I have to say is pretty solid. All in all, I don't think she has a case here, and I don't think the defense thinks she has a case here, but we will certainly see how this goes. She does have a history of mental health issues, but if those even begin to enter the conversation, it ends up feeling like a disservice to others with her same set of issues who don't become like necrophile meth freaks. Anytime I see an NGI plea entered, I just keep thinking about the fact that people with severe mental illness are more likely to be the victim of a violent crime than the perpetrator of one. I'm waiting until we can see the footage of her interrogation so we can see her condition. Like, can we at least see if there's the psychosis element apparently present? Um, that would be part of the meth psychosis defense that her team seems to have been alluding to throughout motions in this case. I do just want to say a Big good luck to her attorney. I hope she doesn't hit him again with like a one, two, like this again. 
We'll certainly be watching the Shabiznis trial as it proceeds, and while it's going on, my heart is definitely with Shad's family, specifically with his mom. One thing the prosecutor nailed about this case was calling it a mother's worst nightmare. Taylor is responsible not only for the death of her son, but for gifting her the most unimaginable horrors to see whenever she closes her eyes. For Shad, for Shad's family, and for the safety of the community, I hope that Taylor receives the punishment that she deserves. If you like this video and you want to keep up with ship business, please consider liking and subscribing. I'm Maddie from Mules and Murder, and I will see you in the next one. Thank you.